Good morning, all. Glad to see you all. I usually don't show too much nervousness, but I think my kids will probably know. But anyhow, I t take it a privilege and a delight to bring a message here. I've never done that before, actually, a message, but uh, I think my kids say I preach a lot, so I, it's not too hard in one sense, but to come up and share the word, that's, that I count a privilege. And uh, it's God who works in us that enables our hearts, right? So, um, yeah, I uh, came across my mind when uh, Pastor Will asked me to preach. I'm like, are you serious? You know, it, that's a little bit nerve wracking, but he said he'll pray for me and he thinks that I could do it. So, okay. I said, I'll leave it at that. If, if I shake it out, I'll let you know. <laughs> but anyhow, in my topic today, what I want to uh, elaborate on, it's not conglomerous, very joyful, but it is about the goodness of God, and that's my topic that I want to um, emphasize and focus on. And uh, just as a bit of an entry, I, I know John for quite some time, and just in the latter times that he has, that the Holy Ghost has sharpened his life, and he's a testimony that what God can do, he can do to you. And in the same way, he did it in me about 20-some years ago, probably 23. And I've been a disciple of Christ ever since, and I've had my share of fair struggles, right? But as he read there in James that counted all joy, and it's true. It works patience in you, and it strengthens you. And I consider that the goodness of God, that we have a privilege that he sent us the comforter to acquaint us in all journeys of life and teach us in the process and strengthen us. We're not alone. We're here with a comfort and we get to express that comfort through first disciplining ourselves and then if I have a family, more of you have, I get to double down. You know, I say something I, I, I'm being watched, right? And I fail in something, I feel unworthy. And then I have to repent and come clean as we had it in the Sunday school. We, come, we have to be pure, clean, sanctified. And Christ, our, com our, our, our Redeemer, did not have to say, I'm sorry, God, that I offended you. But we do. And therefore, it makes him worthy to be our Messiah. Okay, I'd like to pray and then I'll have some scriptures that I want to use as entry. Dear God, we lift your name up in the midst of us, among us. We know you are the maker and the creator. You made it all, but you also give us the word of truth that purifies and sanctifies us wherewith we uh, pilger in this uh, life and become disciples in, in following you and knowing you, we are grateful for that and ask your anointing upon this hour that uh, we would hear you, walk with you, and, in, and, and be stirred and, and encouraged to walk in purity and in righteousness. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's go to um, John 8, 32. I think that's where I want to read a little bit. We had that almost up to there to, in Sunday school, but I want to emphasize on that a little bit, on verse 32 and 31. Um, as, as we had it in Sunday school, it was a, quite a bit of a debate here, right? Trying to, uh, who is the Son of God? But then, in, uh, uh, a little bit earlier, he, many believed. Then said Jesus to the Jews, in verse 31, which believed on him. 
If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So I had this at home yesterday a little bit too on these devotions. Um, We are disciples. God's goodness has come to us through the blessing that he promised to give us the Holy Spirit, right? Isn't he the one that enlightens our understanding? And with that, I want to go to to Luke uh, 24 and 44 and on. I'm going to read that scripture. And if we could all stand for it, then in honor to for God's word, and then we'll... okay, John tw- uh, Luke. 24, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And the repentance and remission of sins should be preached in in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witness of these things. And behold, I send the promise of of, of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Um, God foredid all of this work. He told it. He told us that through the prophets, through the Psalms, He foretold us. And how do we know today that we have that promise? That is simply by faith. We today experience the liberation of our own sin and the clearing of our conscience and sanctifying of our conscience is simply by faith. We see in in the desert when God was grieved and angry with the Israelites. What was the reason that that he was so angry with them? That's because... They did not believe. And so therefore the unbelieving could not, so they perished in the desert. In the same way it will happen to us. We now live 2,000 some years behind, after, the, after Christ's death, and we bear record, we bear witness. The disciples did first. We believe because the disciples did. And they carried the message out from Jerusalem and out and all, and all over the world. And what is that token in your heart that you know that you have the right thing? The Bible says it's the seal, it's the token of the Holy Spirit, the comforter, sealed in your heart. And it's not mystical. We can see the evidence that Paul says, in, I think in the Corinthians, he says that it's, it's a gift to everybody. It's a manifestation. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit is given to everybody the belief, or the, that your life changes. That your life not just changes to something other, no, something that you now have peace to die, that you have, and the psalmist talks about this too, you can walk through the shadow of death, and you have a comforter that acquaints you, God with man, Jesus in the flesh, now we have him through the Holy Spirit that enables us and and encourages us in our fleshly 
mindsets and world we live in to have a deep sense of comfort that empowers us, that embraces us, and that, that he gives us. But how did we get this? He first had to make a big payment. And that was his death on the cross. So we, we can experience that reconciliation with God by faith, right? And once we have faith, it's the substance of things hoped for. Once we have it, we begin to build. Our faith is Christ. Christ is the rock. The Bible talks a lot about rock, right? And so he is that cornerstone, that rock whereupon we build. And then he gives us, the, the spirit that he gives us makes us to be reconciled with God in Christ. He does not point us to anybody except Christ. The Holy Spirit, it's better be doing that. And so, <clears throat> so that the things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses. Are we stuck like the Jews were stuck? They wanted a Messiah that would come and enforce their kingdom and in fact reliberate them from the Romans, right? Didn't happen. In fact, the Romans came by 70 AD and completely destroyed the temple. But this Messiah that Moses was talking about was standing there and arguing with them just before, before here. He's trying, like in, in even in John, the earlier scripture that I read, he was arguing with him that I am he that Moses talked about. And so we don't live in that age, right? But how come that we can have peace that the world can't have, that would give millions to have? How come we have it? And so that's why I say that the token of our seal of life, that we have the right faith and the right spirit, is because God, the Creator, himself puts a resting comfort in you and that he swore in his wrath he would not give to you unless you believed but he did give it to those that believe he comes and what does he do to your life i find this very fascinating i have in the latter times of my christian walk i've i've really studied and, and tried to look into what is the Holy Spirit? What role does he play? Or who is he? And sure, I've been to interesting meetings and different things like that, but they don't have peace. They're attempting to get it. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as Paul says, is evident to every Christian. So what is it? And so... I study, and the Bible teaches me, it says that I'm supposed to study, and so are you. Study for thyself unto prove unto God, ready to, for good workmanship, for the good work that's ahead of us, right? So we are to study. And so it's fascinating to me when I begin to look at it and I saw how the Christian church has been persecuted throughout the ages and what caused them to do it that they willingly lay down their life and for us to have the same kind of rest and peace in our soul that we are willing to lay down our life. I think I am. I know my flesh would probably shake when it came to it, but deep down I know it's foolishness to heed to um, what flesh can do to me. But fear the God who can take your soul in your life. He can kill you and he can save your soul. He can do both. Satan can only take off, kill your flesh, right? And so, um, my, my, uh, my intent is help, so that we would begin to see it more from a, from a godly perspective, the comfort that we have with us. It came with a price, but it is being manifested. We see that men have peace and we see that that is not just happening to certain people. It's happening to the whole body. And many times, we ourselves don't fully understand how it is possible that I have this peace or that person has that peace. 
Well, it is because it's a work of God. It comes to you, and when you have faith, it, it begins to work. And it, the King James Bible says, wrath. Wrath, your living faith in you, it's been working in you. It's been uh, uh, causing you to know him in spirit and in truth. That's, that is something he does in how he has built the church. And in another thought that I have recently thought about is, he says in Daniel that in the times of when he said, when the clay and the iron and partly like that, like in the Roman Empire, which was the Roman Empire, the, the, the picture that we have in Daniel. In that time, he will build his church. That's the time we live in. Grace, mercy, and truth. We live in that time where he is building the church, and that's a mountain, he called it. So that means it's big. And when you look at it, it is big. The church is very big. Do we have plagues and problems and divisions that Satan uses to divide the church? Yes. But we that are bound, uh, baptized in the spirit of truth, we should not allow ourselves to be divided. We should focus on the maker who is in spirit and in truth, guiding and keeping us and empowering us. That is what we should focus on as a body of believers and realize that you are a brother, you are a sister. And if you're not, well, we pray that you would come to the faith because it is a value that's priceless. And so... And that's what we see here in, in, in Luke that has come. And we are the product that the prophets were looking for. They desire to live in the day we and you live in. That we would call upon God wherever we are and worship him. And that God would be glorified throughout the whole world. So Christ, it was needful that Christ had to come in, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was, Israel was a nation where through God spoke. And so, um, verse 45, Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Very important that we pray and that we seek him. And, and we have the promise, if we seek, we will find. But here we see that he opened their understanding of the scriptures. So the scriptures is more than just a textbook. It's a it's a, it's a pathway, a reconciliation with the creator that made and that said to Adam, don't eat of that tree. He intently said that to warn us, but when we did, he had planned that he would be the light again to man. So he redeemed us. And so uh, that's why we want the scriptures and, and, and educate ourselves in our offsprings. Raise a family. And that's... He is, he, it is he amongst us that does these good things. If it was measured according to my doings, and if I look at my life, it wouldn't be so. But my life, that it is graceful, and that I have love, and that I have peace, is evidence that it is God in me. I don't speak of myself because I've learned <laughs> to accept the fact that I need to hate myself. Ouch. We hear a lot of self-help books that say, believe in yourself. No, the Bible says your heart is desperate, wicked. Yeah. And so don't believe in yourself. Believe in Christ who can redeem your wicked heart. So we have a, and your self-esteem and everything will just balance out, you know. You don't need to focus on, oh, I'm so low and I, I'm not counting it. Well, if we're going to go by that measurement, then none of us count. But we raise up God. Jesus Christ in, our, in among us and therefore we have hope even for the trials ahead and then he says he tops it off he says just have joy and it counted joy wow and that is true so that's why I say it. isn't that God's goodness amongst us that we have peace that we have courage to face our own faculties and then to stand up here and say that God is good to me, and while I know very well in my heart, I ain't that good. So it is not about me, but it is about the God who raises the dead, who, who speaks to the dead bones, and they start getting flesh and soul and so on. So are we. We have risen in the faith. So we are the new resurrection in Christ. We stop yielding 
to our own impulses. Yes, we fail, but it doesn't matter. We have Christ on our side to give us more courage and more. And the more you fail, the more grace. It doesn't mean that you're supposed to go more sin, but it means the more sin compels you, the more grace. You won't run out. And so defeating that which is troubling us, that is death. Of course, Satan, Lucifer, he doesn't portray himself to us in a, as a bad guy. He usually comes with tricks that look actually holy. And he quotes scripture to you. He did it to Christ. He does it to me. So he won't leave us. He, won't, he is very cunning. That's why it, it doesn't rise or fall on my understanding or my abilities. But it is God who framed the world, also give us the word and sustains it. And so... His truth endures to all generations. Psalm, he speaks of it. So, uh, verse 44, just finish it off there. Moses, um, he did it through Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me, Christ. You study the Psalms, you find out what he foretold and how he portrayed Christ. You find out of those truths and the product we get out of it if all of those assurances to convince humanity that God is also the Savior. He is the end. He is the beginning. He is all. And he fills all. Not according to our righteousness. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. He, Isaiah says he was bruised for our transgressions. True enough, it happened. And so, and we have that reconciliation. Thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, 46. And the repentance and remissions of sin should be preached and the name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witness of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Until you be endued from power on high. That is what we want to. That's why we read. That's why we cling to have the same source the, the, the strength and the courage to live boldly in this world and not focus on the, the sinful natures that we are acquainted with, but to uh, focus and make sacrifice, lay down our lives, our daily days. We lay them down and put them in subjection. Then we, I, I like to put it like our life, our works, our doings is the might. The Bible says we must love God with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our might. So all three of them got to sink in according to his desire. And so when we lay down and we replace ourselves and we experience the peace, don't think that that was because you did anything. God did it in his own pleasure. He decided, but you were drowned in sin and mire. You were just loving it. Some more, some less in the grievous sins. But he made a name for himself while you were still dead. He came with that, and he used people, preachers like we have in this circle. And that right now, I'm preaching to you, but uses me too. I am merely a servant. So are you in your home. And in your life, whatever you do, you are a light. But that's not of yourself. That's because you have faith. And then as you grow in it and mature in it, more and more fruit begins to hang on that tree. In different ways. We have different callings. That is according to the Holy Spirit's will. He calls us, right? What he wants. But I urge and encourage Whatever your calling is, 
do well with it. Let, it. let it flourish in your life. Don't be obsessed. Don't hinder it by your impulses. That's what I'm talking about. That's why I'm glad that God, the Comforter, is with us, that convicts us, that, that uh, are your conscience, it nags you, he purifies your conscience, but he's able to do the details in your life that I have no way of knowing what it all requires. So all I can be is an encouragement, a messenger, uh, similar to what the apostles were, but the apostles were far um, more unique because they witnessed the flesh. I live in the fruits of what they did. And be, I can experience peace and joy in my work, all of it. It is not for myself. It's, it's not something I, I just do so that I have more glory on the earth. It's actually, I learn to subject everything in, unto his truth and see it with that in mind. It's not my own work. I have ceased to do my own works in this earth. A hundred percent sacrifice on my end. A hundred percent is his. Not ten, not five, not fifty, not almost. All of it. And that is a mystery to me that I have watched Christ work in my soul. That how he picks apart things in my life and restores them. I thought I was a Christian a long time. Well, and I thought I was pretty good. Yeah, but he, he sanctifies. A child, he purifies and he decides. He sanctifies it, and I learn to grow in, in, in understanding and in, in thought. Not to trust my heart, but to trust the God who comes to my heart. The God of eternal salvation that comes to your heart and resides there and saves a carnal being like me and you with an eternal gospel that never fades, but is always true and always right. So, they tarried and wait and went until they were endued with that power, and that Remember that. That's the goodness of, of God um, manifesting in us and among us. That power that they receive, we have today. It's, it's testified. It's manifested. Like Paul says, and I think it's in the Corinthians, he says it's given to everybody to manifest that. And so, okay, I wanted to go to Hebrews to, uh, uh, yet two. Uh, Hebrews chapter one. God, who at sundry times, sundry means ages pass, and in diverse manners spake in time pass unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and uphold it all things by the, by the word of his power. And when he had himself purged our sin, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being, so much, being, being made so much better than the angels as he, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto... Which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bring it in the first begotten unto the world, he say it, and let all the angels of God worship him. So we see that through the scriptures here, we see that God is witnessing that it is the one that he has appointed for our salvation. And so, again, we have been given a good faith that works mighty through the comforter that Jesus Christ sent us. That's the faith. And we see that 
through the prophets, through the, through the history, and that God is now approving it. And what is God doing in our lives today? What is convincing you that he is real and that he is the one that you will give an account to? He made you, and he has a right when he made you. The maker has a right to judge what he makes, right? And so he has made you. Are you standing with the token, the, re- the blood of Christ before the throne? Are you ready for that? Are you going to attempt to face God and say, I did 100,000 good deeds, and I give this, and I, I did... I did many multitudes of things. Are you willing to stand before the throne of judgment? You have already been proven guilty, even by your own conscience. Just like we had in Sunday school, that the man that didn't have any sin was supposed to throw the rocks at the woman. Well, they all one by one walked out, and he said, by your conscience you did that. You walked out. How's your conscience bothering you today? Are you clean? Are you... Are you trying to stand before the throne of God with your conscience? Without the purging and application of the blood of Christ and the seal of the Holy Ghost? I don't think so. I warn you, don't do that. Because it won't pay. Take Christ and then be his disciple as we read in, in, uh, in Luke, I think, 44, that scripture that I quoted earlier. And he has lifted him so high, higher than the angels. The angels now bow down to him and worship him. And so we have no excuse. We, we have scriptures. We have the evidence that he is able to uh, raise us from dead works. We have the Holy Ghost to comfort us. We have no excuse anymore. It will be worse for us than it was for the Jews, our end if we don't reconcile with God. So, uh, where did I stop here? Uh, I'll read, continue to read in, in, in 7 here. And, uh, and of the angels, he said, who make it his angel spirit and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he said, th- thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Scripture. A, a scepter of righteousness in the, in, a sep, in the scepter of the kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. He is God. Do you see it? He is God. He, he took on the form of flesh, but he is God, and he, in, in he is approving of him. For himself, and, and, the, and God can only be God because he has those attributes. We don't have that, but he does, right? And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are thy works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shall thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he, at any time, sit at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So again, I speak quite a bit on the comforter. And here he he brings out ministering angels for those that are heirs of salvation. He has assigned angels to minister to us, to strengthen us, to embolden us. Therefore, chapter 2, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let, let them slip, drift away. For if, we, if, if the word spoken by angels was st- steadfast, in every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, 
both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. We are men that deal with a God that has interest in our soul. Why? I don't know. And if we were to look at our own lives, we would all know that, no, we shouldn't qualify. But God takes delight in taking the rubbish and making it shine. And if you take pride in yourself that you are something, God begins the mission of tearing you down. He, he said that to the Israelites. They, God made them prosper and they soared. And then they got haughty and proud in themselves. They, they trusted in their temple, even to the point all the way until Christ, they killed him because he didn't. They had so much trust in their own doings, they didn't see the, the God of the gift. They didn't worship him and give him honor and praise. And so the same thing can befall on us today. And much worse, because we already have the inward spirit of God that comes not just through a demand, but it comes through us, to us, in spirit and in truth, and enables in tabernacles in you, lives in you. And we choose to neglect that? There's no second hope. If you don't want that, the second death is going to be worse. But now we have an opportunity to believe, to trust, and to, and to live a peaceful life, a hopeful life that Satan enjoys to tempt. And as John read, the tempter entices our desires. But God has decided for you to sacrifice them and to glorify his name by you laying down your passions for him and allow Christ's truth to rule in your heart, your mind, and in your life, your, your work. That is beautiful. It's, it's comforting to know that we have a comfort that will acquaint us that's bigger than death itself. For a man to die is appointed, right? He wants to die. We'll all give up our flesh. We'll, we'll lose it. So it's not really a big... Uh, price to pay to lay down what would you lose anyway. The life you have is usually capped at about 70, 80. Some go into the 90s. But it's capped. And God is asking you to lay it down for that which you will never lose. And so in that life, the way you raise your children, the way you treated your friend, the way you treated your co-worker, the way you do work. God, the Bible says, I think in Ecclesiastes, he says, that work is for this purpose, that a man is thereby exercised. It's not such that you can build a massive empire and boast and brag, although I love that. But I have to say, God, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll be on the mission you call me to do. And you lay it down. That's what that means, taking up the cross upon your life and then to be a disciple. A disciple continues, continues, and continues until he puts his last breath. He lays it down. That's what it means. And that's, it's not just a duty. You could look at it from a, from a fleshy perspective. It would feel like it's a duty. But when you look at it from a spiritual and you see it from his side and he has enlightened the scriptures to you through the Holy Ghost, you begin to see that that's a privilege. To have eternal life in you and God coming to me, a man like me, and to just make a storm out of my life and just pulls all the weird stuff out of my life and just throws it aside and begins to shine, that is really good. That is so valuable that we, as with carnal eyes or uncircumcised beings, very tough sometimes to actually see the value. But when we continue in the spirit of truth and in Christ and in his doctrine and in his teachings and do what he says and obey him, uh-oh, I'm sorry, I counted rubbish like Paul said. 
It's rubbish. It's, it's basically robbing Christ. To lay down my stupidity to get that which I can't lose and have life and joy and peace, that is, that's not a fair trade at all. And so we have a beautiful and a joyful, it's, it's a great joy that he prophesied through the prophets and in, in the scriptures that would come in the latter days. Ever since Christ, we're living in the latter days. And in those latter days, we are experiencing what I am telling you. Peace with God, joy, happiness, delight, courage, not dismayed at your own shortcomings, but ever more pressing in and drinking of that cup and of that living waters that he has installed in your heart and letting it trickle through through your mind, through the end of your fingers and through the feet that you, that, that you use to walk. And the language you use He's sanctifying. He came to fill it all. And he is. And I, I enjoy seeing that. It gives me comfort to know these truths and study them. And now I, I just get to share them with you in the, my best ways. But it's a personal life. It's your life. And I just wish you courage in that. Strength in that. Who knows? In the times we live, sometimes it looks like we could be called on the altar to die for something because I spoke too harsh. So choose your words carefully so you don't just die or are put in prison because you, didn't, you, you were choosing your words carelessly. I'd rather be in prison for good words and guiltless and innocent. That, I could bear that. It would be much easier for me than, oh, I lied a little and I had to go because my lie affected so many lives and people were killed. That's why one of the reasons why we're not supposed to have false witness, right? We're not supposed to. The law says that we are not supposed to bear false witness. If we do that, it, there can be consequences. And so then I must bear, right? But now we have God on our side. And if we believe him, and if we obey him, and, and, he, and he reveals these truths to us, and we can grow in these truths. Okay, verse 4 there. Um, Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Remember, God does as he please, and he should, and I'm glad he does. He gives gifts, diverse, to, for the edifying of the body. So he builds his church. He builds his body. We are his living rocks. For unto the angels, for chapter 2, verse 5, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? O the son of man that thou visitest him? I think you will find it in Psalm 8 and Job. You can, I'm not going to read those scriptures. But thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. It's our assignment. God set us to do good, all kinds of good deeds. And it's a wonderful place to, to do good, even after the fact that it's sinful, after the fact that we have experienced death in our bodies, in our soul, in our mind, God has chosen to put a redemption there so we don't have an excuse. So we now can glorify God with our actions, with our mouth, with our mind, everything, through the second opportunity, through the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ. Wherewith we now live our lives and magnify him in the world that was put under us. He put it in charge. We were in charge of it. We made a mess out of it. He comes in like a father and shows you the second time how to do it. All he wants is obedience from you. 
not using this world to try to earn salvation with him. When I say this world, I mean your actions. You're trying to do a better deed. You're not going to reconcile yourself to God. It's a waste of time. In fact, he goes so drastic to say that he counts it as filthy rags. So we shouldn't do that. And so to obey is, and to fulfill the old Mosaic law is to trust, to believe in him that he would send. Moses said he will send one like me among you and believe in him and do everything he says. They didn't do that. In fact, they argued with him and they resisted him and, and finally gave him over to be crucified. And we read how much worse for us. We think they did bad. But how about you having the Holy Ghost, the promise of God in you, and with you, and you're profaning it, you're defiling it, you're using his name in vain. It's rare that I hear that people use the Holy Ghost in vain. But the Son, that's forgiveness. But I find it interesting. That maybe it is because they don't know the Holy Ghost. It's probably a good thing because you don't want to profane his name. And so I think we have God's goodness on our side, the opportunity to escape death and live a life that is truly not for myself. I don't care about that. But I care that good sprouts out of my life, out of your life. And then I have your best interest in mind. No excuse to not go and try again. I fell to the ground, but I stood up and said, God, thank you for forgiveness, and thank you for the wisdom to try again. I could speak a long time, but <laughs> I, I don't know. How long do we usually preach here? One hour? Okay. Okay, let's go to verse 8, because I'm not done yet, so... Just fasten down, you know. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Here is talking about Christ. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. It's God's grace. He, he willingly came down, suffered, came, became lower, so that we could have reconciliation with God and, and live in peace and in unity. And I, with that, I, I, I feel like it, we can talk about peace and unity, but how do we apply it? That we fundamentally see that I am one with you because of the act of God. I don't like you because of your actions, you, the way you speak and the way you character. Uh, get lost, you know. Try some new classes uh, till I can accept you. Or something. I don't think so. It's God, is it Jesus Christ, the head of the table, and he corrects his home, just like I do in my house. I get to practice what, <laughs> what he does to the church. But as a father in the house, you don't like it when the children are divided. You come and step in between and you say, uh-uh. My mom used to have a practice. Kiss each other instead of fighting. And in German, it sounds a little different, but it, we kind of hated it. We didn't like that very much because you were right now on the mission of proving the point that I didn't like what the brother did to me. And so I think it helps us to see that it's not church buildings and walls that we have to shelter us. That's the purpose they're here for. That's it. We have one doctrine, one Holy Spirit, one faith. Now amongst it, we, we have, if we look at our history, the, 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 it, it looks like to me, I don't know if I'm 100% accurate, but about the 1500s, that's where it began to happen. We had so many varieties. And if you go down to ground zero, 
you find out one Jesus, one Messiah. One Messiah that blesses that nation, that blesses that individual, that blesses that family. He does it as he wills. So who am I to divide the brotherhood or the, the church? We're not allowed to do that. Test your own hearts. Realize that we have a reconciliation with God through Christ, through the deposit of his Holy Spirit in us, comforts us, who enables us to have courage, strength. It is his doing, not ours. We have different cultures. Cultures don't, are kind of like walls, like of a church. They have, they have their place, but we shouldn't allow them to divide us in the body of Christ. And so, um, God Almighty made out of two, one. The heathen and his own, the Jews. We see the picture there again through all the world. And so, it's ironic, it's sometimes interesting. I had a little bit of an experience a couple of years ago. It's not that interesting, really, but I, I, I noticed something. I, we went to Campeche, and, uh, and uh, we went to my brother's place, and, and I saw a couple guys standing and talking there. I don't know. Yeah, it was just a couple guys. I'll make the story short. But the point is, I looked at them, and I'm like, he looks old colony. But I said, he's a believer. That's what I thought. And for some reason, he came to my vehicle. I, I stayed in the vehicle. He came there, and then he talked, and I just listened. And I was convinced that this man is a believer. What is it that you know? Well, that goes to say what Paul said in Corinthians, that for, to every man, I think it's Corinthians. I keep quoting it. I should probably make sure that it's there. But you can just read the whole Bible and find out, right? <laughs> but anyway, the manifestation is given to us all. And when you see that, for the, for the think of, of uh, Jerusalem, the, the, the Jews, when they heard that the heathen had the Holy Ghost as well, I can kind of imagine it was a little cr uh, crunching inside. Really? They are pagans. They shouldn't have it. But they did. So the point, and, and, and so that's why we, we don't want to get stuck on our own ways of life. It's very dangerous. Traditions. I come from a religious background too. It's very easy to get stuck there. That's what Satan uses to divide us. And so let's let's not allow us to do that. Let's let's focus on that Christ has given the Holy Ghost for a purpose in your heart, so that thereby you grow. And when I see that in the, the least among us, do I run it down? Test your hearts. Are you lifting them up? Are you adding to the flame? Are you edifying with your talents and gifts that God has given you? That's the point of the gifts that he gives us. And so that's the whole point. We don't, we don't tolerate dirty sins because I wanted a Savior to, to liberate me from sin, right? So that doesn't mean that a person is at a different levels or of, of, of a journey of life, that it's acceptable. No. In fact, I judge that. I say, no. That, that, and I do that to myself. But ultimately, it's Christ's judgment we use to live. It's not, everything is already judged, so we live by his judgments. And so... Uh, I felt like I wanted to dig into it, but drill it a little bit more home. That how much one we are is not the point so that now everything flies. The more one we are, that is there to, to help each other more, to drift away from that which is filthy and allow him to sanctify us. Not underestimating his power. For every man, to, uh, nine, and I'll, I'll read uh, ten. 
For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. He is indeed our captain because of him suffering on our behalf. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So I think it helps really much for us as, and I speak of this because I, I know how I feel in life and what, how God has dealt with me in life, that it helps to realize God is God. I am being sanctified by his grace and thereby enabled to do all kinds of good deeds, good works. But Satan then comes and says, wow, Dave, you're wonderful. You're very good here. So what does he do? The intent is to steal my heart and to de cause me to deviate to the left or to the right. That's why we need to be awake. Watch. Watch over your hearts. And pray for each other and watch over each other. Especially if you have a family. Watch over the kids. See if they have a bitter heart. The pastor we have, I'm grateful for him. He preaches lots of good messages. I'm, I'm really encouraged by them the leadership. And so they oversee the flock and they their job is to be a servant to us or to Christ rather. But we, we are being fed. In some ways it's almost not fair but they have to lay down so much. But it's good. They're willing to do that because God placed them there to serve us. And you better listen. You better study because you can't just say everything they say is good and, and fine. No, they're humans. God is using people like us that are tempted and drawn away to, for you, so you will have to study and see if it's of truth. So it keeps you awake. It's not as simple as, I have a gift and you don't. Sanctified. And they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto thy, my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, in the children which God hath given me, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the shame that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is, the devil, and delivered them whom through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham which was also the promise that he would come through Abraham. But anyway, again, um, he did all of this for us. And now we have the privilege to lay down our lives and to live a life that is holy, that is uniquely and only he himself can usher you in your thought life, in your heart, and in your actions. We see your actions. And then it's a bonded us as brothers and sisters that love you if you have faulty character and you are careless about it we are called by God not because I feel like I want to criticize you but we are called to call you out that bonds us not that I want to get rid of you but that Satan would not snare you away that's what it means to be a watchman a servant to watch the flock and so, um, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'd like to pray yet, and I'll finish right here. Dear Father in heaven, I think it a privilege that you um, poured your truth in my soul, my heart, my mind. 
and that you do the same among so many of us. And I pray, Lord, that whoever in here is not in this fold, in this truth, that somehow you would draw them, that you would cause them to be reconciled to you and begin a journey of disciple where you care for him, where, you, where he allows himself to be under your care and to be sanctified by your goodness in our life. I ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.